Vítajte pri počúvaní podcastu Ines. Všetky naše ďalšie podcasty si môžete vypočuť na stránke ines.sk lomitko audio. Prajeme vám príjemné počúvanie. Hostom dnešnej epizódy je profesor Enrico Colombato z Talianskej univerzita degli Studi di Torino. Na Slovensku prišiel na pozvanie konzervatívneho inštitútu Milana Rastislava Štefánika a začiatkom júna vystúpil s prednáškou v rámci programu Sequels. All eyes now also in Slovakia are on Greece. Uh, the crisis in Greece. Uh, Italy is the third biggest economy in the eurozone. Uh, you are doing pretty well with your deficit. I think you have a positive primary balance. Uh, on the other hand, uh, There is the, the huge debt, uh, the rapid changes of, of government, a problem to force some, some more deeper intensive reforms. Uh, so it's kind of a Damoclean sword situation. Uh, mm-hmm. so, so do you believe Italy may be the next in the news in the following months or years? Everything depends on what the European Central Bank is going to do. Uh, we are broke, period. Um, the only reason why we don't make headlines is that the European Central Bank has promised to print all the euros it takes to bail us out. And people or markets believe it. But if tomorrow morning Draghi or whoever said enough with bailing out country and enough with uh, quantitative easing, we, we are virtually broke. Um, there i believe there is a big difference between North Italy and South Italy, like North yeah. being kind of a small Germany, South black with corruption and similarity. So how is it possible that even in one country uh, it, it's so difficult to like change the, 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 the structure in, in one region, uh, the institutions in one region, Uh, and make them more like North. Maybe more general question because this kind of goes with the, with the whole Europe. So what, what are the mystical uh, structural reforms Europe should do so more southern countries turn into northern countries in economic terms? Reduce regulation, well three things. Reduce regulation, reduce public expenditure, improve the judiciary. Why it haven't happened yet in Italy? Because people in the south vote. So if you're a politician and if you want to carry, if you, let's, you know that the South is heavily subsidized by the North in terms of transfers of money, North to South. If you're a politician and if you cut the transfer of subsidies from the North to the South, you're going to lose your elections. So if you're a politician, you're never going to do it. So what is the political situation now? Because we all remember the famous Mr. Berlusconi, but for now in Slovakia the Italian politics are a bit, bit in a distance. Well, nothing's happened. I mean, uh, Renzi has been in power for 16 months and he's done virtually nothing. Uh, he's changed the electoral law and nobody cares about it. He promised to reduce public expenditure, he's not done it. He's prom- he has promised to reduce taxation, and taxation is actually increased. Um, he promised he would reform the judiciary, nothing. He promised he would reform the labor market, he did some tiny changes, which produced no results. Um, he promised to deregulate and to simplify the bureaucracy, he's done nothing. So we are more or less where we were say um, one and a half years ago. In the meantime, public expenditure has gone up, public debt has gone up, unemployment has gone up. So he's been very good at talking, but not so good at doing. And people are getting, you know, he's been selling hopes. And people had uh, believed he could deliver. And he's done nothing. So people start being disappointed. Do you have Beppe Grillo has a uh, chance to to be uh, the prime minister in the future years? Not at all. Not at all. Um, now he's a populist. 
He does not really have uh, an economic program. He is good at attacking the others, but he is not really good at proposing an alternative. Um, the quality of his people is also highly variable. Uh, he has some good people. Uh, I mean, by good, I mean honest. Uh, but you know, honesty is not enough. You must be able, skillful, technically able to do something. And populist movements will never be able to do much because they can bring together protest votes, but they hardly bring about reforms. So they're good in the negative when it is against somebody. Uh, they're not so good when they have to do something and bring about change. So you believe even Syriza in Greece uh, is here only for a while? Uh, for a while? Yes, it, you know, it depends on how you define a while. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, I think that people, you know, they came to power promising easy fix solutions. And now the Greeks are finding out the hard way that nobody has a magic wand and that easy fix solutions do not exist. Well, one of the issues in Italy is the grey economy, which is quite a, quite a big there. Uh, how, how do you look at the grey economy? Is it is it a problem in the economy which has to be solved, or is it more like a like a defense for people against uh, excessive regulation and taxation? Well, look, it's a safety valve. Every money, every penny that is not given to the government is a penny which is not going to be wasted. So, although. Uh, I'm not saying that all those who work in the grey economy are saints. What I'm saying is that if we did not have a grey economy, we would be bust. So I'm in great favor of the grey economy and of the black economy. Uh, and I hope it, it lives long. The problem is that the government, when it does not get the money from the bad from the black economy or the grey economy squeezes the other even harder and so he is going to kill those who are surviving either he sends them into the black area or he kills them and nowadays we have hundreds of companies that shut down every every day in Italy and this does not bode well for the future and What about the Italian banking system? It's crazy. Inefficient, uh, protected from competition, and it's been kept alive by government first and by the European Central Bank now. So it's another weakness of the country. But you know, you can understand it. Look, if you're a banker, and I tell you, look, i can make 5-6% interest rate by buying government bonds or I can make 4-5% or 5 by giving the money to a company. What are you going to do? You buy government bonds. And this is where we stand. So credit for small companies has been tiny. Uh, bankers have not been used to doing the job because you know, a banker would make his targets by buying government bonds. So they don't care about whether you give money to a good company or a bad company. They've been used to buying government bonds. So I can bet you are not a fan of quantitative easing. No, quantitative easing is distorting the system. It distorts signals. It gives bankers the impression that money comes your way anyway. You don't have to fight to get it. You just have to operate the printing machine. And, you know, this is not a good example. And one day or another, that money must go back where it came from. So if you were the Italian leading the uh, European Central Bank and not Mario Draghi, wh what would be your very first step? I would go to the holiday on holiday and would do absolutely nothing. I would not carry out monetary policy. I would say, look, this is the money supply and this is where I stand. 
and I'm not going to manipulate the interest rate or I'm not going to bail out banks and I'm not going to bail out governments. Period. I would be as neutral as I possibly could. And you believe this is what ECB should have done five, six, seven years ago. And this is what is written on in the statutes of the ECB. I mean, the, the, there are two things. One, the, the um, in the positive, the ECB should keep price stability. Now, price stability means zero percent. I know that the European Central Bankers Draghi means, claims that price stability means a two percent increase on average. This is not stability. When you go to elementary school, they tell you stability means stable. It means neither up nor down. So two percent every year for 20 years, that means purchasing loss of purchasing power of by 25 percent. That is not price stability. This is inflation. Moderate, but inflation. So first thing, you should have stuck to price stability. Second thing, it is written in the statute that you cannot buy government bonds and you cannot bail out banks nor governments. He did both. If you had a reasonably well operating judiciary system, they would have taken them to court, all the board members, for violating the statute of the European Central Bank. So it's highly politicized. And don't tell me that you are in favor of independent central banking, because this is not, in, you know, by statute it could be independent. But in fact, they take orders from politicians. So what about the, the growing popularity of the idea of uh, not targeting price stability, but NGDP, the nominal GDP? Uh, I believe... Well, well, I think the European Central Bank should have no targeting. They should keep um, the money supply stable, or if you really want to keep the prices stable, you might want to, say, um, have a Friedmanite rule, which is a 2% rule of increase of the money supply in the long run, so as to accommodate the increase in the money demand. But we are talking about details. Uh, no targeting, just stay, keep the money in circulation. Uh, if you ask me, I would go for a gold standard so that you kill all the problems because the gold is there uh, and the only increase in money supply would come from new gold mines. But, uh, yeah, you might want to kill, you m I'm happy if you want to target nominal GDP, but um, as long as you have a rule and you stick to it. Speaking about gold, uh, it, it's a bit interesting that Italy is uh, third or maybe fourth uh, country with the biggest uh, gold reserves in the world. So how comes? On one hand, you had like lira, which wasn't the most stable currency in the world. On the other hand, uh, Italy keeps pretty large uh, gold reserves. No, it, the lira was pretty uh, very good currency until the late 60s. We had a very low inflation. Um, and it was a good currency. I mean, Italy had a bad reputation for monetary policy starting with the 70s because they used the printing machine in order to finance public expenditure. And we kept gold because um, uh, we... Uh, it was the tradition after we've always had kept large amounts of gold and we, also, we always wanted to insulate from um, uh, exchange rate risk and, uh, and the like. So but besides, don't forget that until the early 70s, we were on the gold exchange standard. So having dollars or having gold was roughly the same thing. You are, you are known as, as a vigorous defender of, of free market approach. but. How difficult is to to state your position after after seven years of crisis when a uh, large uh, chunk of public uh, blames the markets uh, for the crisis? How can you blame the market for the crisis when you, know, you cannot say that we are in a free market economy if you have fifty percent of GDP, which are public expenditure, about forty five percent of taxes, and you cannot blame the market if you are printing thousands of pages of regulation every year? 
it's not a free market system. This is a highly regulated system. Some people call it regulated capitalism or, say, social democracy or whatever, but this is not a free market system. How can you call it a free market system if you bail out governments? How can you call it a free market system if you bail out banks? How can you call it a free market system if you have a persistent uh, attempt to keep interest rates down? That's nothing to do with free markets. But do you think in the, in the, in the public opinion, uh, has, has the notion of, of how free markets are working grown or uh, the free markets has lost the public debate or are losing the public debate current in these days? Oh. I think that we have lost it um, time ago when the in the early some 15 years ago when the public opinion was not alerted vividly enough to the dangers of expansionary monetary policy and uh, we have been silent or perhaps too silent when people started saying oh this is the neoliberalism or whatever and this is what is happening. So we've lost it. Uh, I would say that in my area, which is the Austin, so the extreme libertarian, so to speak, right now are being listened to much more carefully. So for example, the Austrian business cycle theory, uh, which is the explanation of the crisis given by the libertarians, uh, draws much larger, larger audiences than, say, 10 years ago. So uh, people are afraid of free markets because free, mar free market system tells you we've made mistakes, now we must pay for them, and nobody wants to pay. So people fear it. But there is some kind of readiness to listen, at least. So people are curious, let's put it this way. If I started a free market political party tomorrow, I would not win the elections, but I would probably have a lot of people listening to me. They would not vote for me, but they would listen to me. This is my... People, you know, don't like painful solutions. And free market supporters suggest painful solutions. One of the key points of uh, of your book is that economics as a, as a science turned from from moral science more into technocratic consequentialist uh, kind of a science. Isn't this one of one of the reasons why we have the current crisis, both financial and both in the in the economics as a science? Oh yes, that's been a disaster. Now, this uh, view, according to which economics is a hard science which must be run by technocrats, that's been a disaster. And public opinion, regrettably, has identified these technocrats, which in academic circles are called the neoclassical school, with the libertarian, the free market system. Neoclassical technocrats are not free market individuals, because free market is about individual responsibility, individual enterprise, and uh, it's not against uh, easy fix solutions and it's not about regulation. The neoclassical system is about regulation. So just to give you an example, the IMF is not for free market. It's for optimal regulation. A free market supporter would never do what the IMF has been doing or what it's doing. Once again, look at Greece. A free market economy would never bail out Greece. The IMF has been pouring millions of dollars or euros into Greece. So if, if you look one or two years ahead, where, where do you see Eurozone and Europe, uh, European Union? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I think, well, the European Union is going to be where it is today. I don't think that we're going to have major changes. Um, the Eurozone, yes, Greece might leave. It's, it's really... It's not an economic decision, it's a political decision. Who's going to pay the price? And you have two options. Either Greece is going to be bailed out again, in which case losses are spread over all over the, say, European continent, let's put it this way. 
or Greece goes to the bottom. The Greece uh, is goes out of the euro. It prints drachmas. It produces inflation, and the Greeks will pay for it because, after all, inflation is a tax. So uh, the, I don't know what's going to what, what the Greek choice is going to be, but it's a political choice. Uh, I thought that Syriza had some plans, but appears they have no plans at all. They probably didn't, they never thought about leaving the euro, and they would they thought they would blackmail the rest of the eurozone. They say, oh, if we quit, we're going to trigger a major crisis. Um, and now they see that um, they might have to start printing drachmas, and they know, do not know what to do and how to do it. Do you believe if, if Greece leaves the, the Eurozone and maybe falls into the inflationary spi uh, spiral, that it will be uh, some kind of last call for uh, many Eurozone politicians and they will finally start to, to follow the fiscal rules? Or do you believe that the, the, these rules will never be followed? I think that if Greece leaves the Euro, Draghi will go on TV shows the day, seconds after that, saying, don't worry, we're going to print all the euros you need because they don't want to go down to history as those who destroy the Euro eurozone. Now, uh, so interest rates in Italy, France, Spain, Portugal would go up, but not much. And uh, we'll keep treading water. I don't think that if Greece goes down, our politician will learn the lesson. Now remember, a politician, the time horizon of, I don't know about Slovakia, but I can guarantee that in Italy, <laughs> the time horizon of a politician is a couple of years at most. And uh, if they can create their rents and keep in power for two years, they don't, they're not interested to go down to history as the man who saved the country. Okay, and the last question, to be more optimistic, uh, do you have any interesting book uh, you are reading now or you just finished reading which you would recommend? Yes, uh, there is a good, very good book by Larry White, The Clash of Ideas or Ideologies. If, if you look at the internet, Larry White, The Clash of Ideas, I think. And that, that is a very good book. I would recommend that one. <laughs> um, I also, I just finished a little book um, on Aetius. Aetius was a Roman general in the early 5th century. And uh, so just before the fall of the Roman Empire. And it tells you how much we are dependent on people with a vision and people with charisma and substance. So, you know, what we, my, my view is that right now we need leadership. This is what we don't have. Uh, and if we find good leaders, things could just turn 180 degrees so nicely. Thank so you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and we are hoping to welcome you in Slovakia soon again. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs>